about the carbon storage potential of furniture. I appreciate you all being here. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Torsten Arndt. I'm head of communications at PEFC International. I'd like to start this webinar by introducing you to this fluffy guy. He is a two meter tall, 300 kilo heavy flurry animal. And he is Mr. Link. He is the star of a movie called Missing Link. And as such, he even won a Golden Globe. Now, why am I talking to you about the missing link? Because that is the topic of today's webinar. We have, on the one hand, regulators, consumers, retailers, who are looking for purchasing carbon-free furniture. On the other hand, we have forests, huge carbon storage potential, and they deliver a fantastic material. It's a tree and the wood that it produces. By default, it is carbon neutral. But what's the missing link? How do we get this wood from this furniture to the consumer who looks for carbon neutral material? Allow me to introduce you to the first speaker, Michael Berger who will shed a little bit more light about why we are interested in purchasing carbon neutral products and how we can get the carbon neutral material from the forests to the final product. Michael Berger is CEO of PEFC International. He is a dedicated hiker, and I believe he'll talk about one of his recent hikes in his presentation. Over to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Torsten, for the introduction and the link to hiking. Uh, good day, everyone here from Geneva. <clears throat> um, I told Torsten a small story this morning uh, from hiking. I was just in, on holidays for two weeks. It's my first office week uh, ag again. And I was hiking in the Swiss Alps so not that far away from Geneva. And I made an incredible personal experience. You see on this picture, the Alec Glacier, it's the greatest glacier in the European Alps, still about 22 kilometers. And almost exactly 40 years ago, I made as a young teenager with my father, the first uh, glacier crossing of the Alec Glacier. We, we crossed it a little bit further down here. This is a part where it's still, you, you see it, it's majestic, it's gigantic, it's still a giant of, of earth history. And we, we crossed it a little bit further down. So today, and that was, uh, you know, I, I can still feel it in, in each cell. That's this area where the green dot is going. 40 years ago, we crossed the glacier uh, around this place. And today you see just a gigantic landslide. This landslide, and, and that's, that's quite interesting actually, the landslide took place because the ice is missing and the pressure of the ice against the mountains is missing. So the earth, the, the, the stones start falling down and it's not, it looks quite small on this picture, it's gigantic and the whole mountain here is moving. So when you go a little bit up there, there are big, uh, cracks in, in the mountain. People cannot go there anymore and it's horrible. And I could really, you know, 40 years ago, I had a very different experience and that's that tells you that something's going on on this planet. That's a little bit strange. And of course, uh, you can say, well, it's just the experience of a few hikers there in the mountains. Uh, if they don't if they can't go there anymore, it's not that bad. But uh, we all know, and I don't need to say anymore, that there are lots of other pretty bad examples and experiences concerning changes which happened uh, recently that we can observe specifically this year. And I guess it's a common understanding in science, meanwhile, that carbon, too much carbon in the atmosphere 
is at least a significant contributor to this development. And that's now a little bit the a part of the link. We have a gigantic machine. We have a machine that actually is just growing by itself and just taking the carbon from the atmosphere, building it into its material and, and using it for further purposes. So when you look at the world's forest, it's a gigantic amount of carbon uh, we, which are sequestered by those forests. And that's that's uh, another step of the link when, when we're talking about sequestra uh, sequestration, the forest, the trees take the carbon from the atmosphere, they build it in their storage, in their material, and we can use it. We can build products, we can substitute existing products, uh, less environmentally favorable products. We, we can develop new products based on this gigantic material timber. So, of course, also this has a downside. Um, there is a gigantic increase to be expected in, for the demand of timber. Uh, when PFC developed, when, when our working group developed in 2017, the current version of our International Sustainable Forest Management Benchmark, we uh, appointed a research company to, to do a study about expected timber demand. And you see the sources, FAO, WBCSD, and there are lots of other sources saying all a little bit a different, drawing a little bit a different picture, but generally saying the same, we have to expect a gigantic increase of demand of timber. And quite simple, just a more or less a blank page. If we don't, if we are not careful with that, we, we get something that nobody really wants to have. So we need sustainably sourced substitution products or sustainably sourced products to be able to really use the advantages of this gigantic carbon transformation machine. So and that's now actually the link to the product, to furniture. Uh, PFC is, as, an, as a sustainable forest management organization, certification organization, we support a couple of product groups specifically, of course, timber use in general, but we're dealing with a number of uh, different products and timber furniture or wooden furniture are one is one group of those products why is it important well growing population in the next 20 years next 15 years uh, close to 8.5 billion uh, just this will increase the need of timber or and the use of, of furniture changing consuming behavior. Uh, people buy are more consciously buying materials. They are more consciously buying wooden products, wooden furniture in their environment. Walking barefoot on a wooden floor is not just good for climate, it's also quite good for people. Favorable government behavior to support this and yeah, just comfortable office environments, living environments with wooden furniture. The forests must be managed sustainably. Otherwise, uh, again, we have the devastation, we, we have the bad effects, and we need to do something to, to support sustainable forest management and sustainably managed forests. Um, what can we do concerning products? Again, concerning the furniture products that which are available. We need a sustainable forest management concept. Forests are managed sustainably. We need the link to the consumer. We need a so-called chain of custody. That means a traceable way, a way from the forest to the product, to the user of the product. And of course, very important, we need the communication. We, without the communication of this effects, it's useless, nobody believes us. And that's the part where PFC comes into the game. The people of PFC, people, I consciously use this picture with lots of PFC people because we cannot just expect that the forests are solving the climate challenge for us. And we are just sitting there and consuming and doing everything like always. If people, if we don't 
support this, it's again, the best machine is useless. So those people, they contribute, the PFC contributes to for the development of forest management concepts, standards, ways how to manage forests. PFC is working on the chain of custody, how to trace material, how to ensure that material from sustainably forest ma managed forests is coming to the products. And PFC is providing tools for communication. So this means the, the certification at the very end of such a process actually is a kind of promise to the consumer, to the society, to the forest, to the globe, to the universe, that these products are coming, they have a sustainable origin, and that we can use them in a responsible way for our daily life. This morning, I've seen, I, when I come to the office, I, uh, one of the first things is always quickly checking a few, um, a, a, a few social media tools. This morning, I've seen something on LinkedIn, I, I, it's not funny. It's, it's quite tragic, but I have to admit, I, I laughed when I've seen it. Uh, the, the climate change timeline, I hear the source. So, so it's, it's not my idea. It's not PFC's idea. Um, you see a long period, climate change isn't real. We don't believe that it exists. Okay, climate change is real. We are just not convinced that it's caused by humans and maybe we can't do anything. Then the oops period is coming. And then the period that I can only describe with words that I don't want to articulate in public. And I'm not sure whether we are still in the red or in already in the yellow, but anyway, using wooden products, using wooden furniture for our daily life does not just make us comfortable. It's good for climate, it's good for society. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us with this webinar. Thank you very much for buying lots of wooden products and lots of wooden furniture. And I'm very much excited now to listen to Francesco who's going into much more details. And back to you, Thorsten, I guess. Thank you so much, Michael. And keep in mind that if you have any questions, either about what Michael has been talking about or what Francesco will be talking about, please use the chat. We are getting to all of these questions uh, at the end, uh, towards the end of this webinar, and we will hopefully all answer them. But now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Francesco Necro, who lives in this beautiful Italian city of Torino. He is assistant professor in wood technology at the Department of Agriculture, Forest and Food Science. And he's also a member of the executive board of the International Society of Wood Science and Technology and of the editorial board of the scientific journal Wood and Fiber Science. In short words, he actually knows what he's talking about. Francesco, I'm very curious about the insights that you will be providing us with when it comes to the carbon storage potential of wood furniture. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for your very kind introduction. Welcome you all. And of course, thanks to PFC for the organization of these events. I'm going to share my screen right now so you can see my presentation. Uh, full screen. Can you see it? Can you hear me well? All fine. Okay, so um, so uh, during the next next uh, thirty minutes, uh, I will talk about uh, carbon storage in wooden furniture. This is a huge topic of key importance, and so I'm trying to give you. Uh, a first introduction on the main concepts and elements of this topic. And uh, when preparing this presentation, uh, uh, at first I thought about an introduction on climate change, but uh, well, I don't think it is uh, actually needed. We all know what climate change is, 
the words of, uh, and the images of Michael before were uh, very clear. And so I, I think it is sufficient to show this uh, slide that reports uh, the changes in global temperature relative to the period from 1971 to 2000. And as you can see, starting from around the 90s, the average global temperature started to constantly and increasingly be higher than the average. So this is the global warming we are facing. And we all know the link between global warming and climate change. We all know the effects of global warming in terms of storms, uh, wildfires, droughts, and so on. And uh, uh, a key engine of global warming is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, here you can see that in the past uh, 20 years, 15, 20 years, uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide uh, constantly increased uh, in the atmosphere. And this, despite all uh, the commitments, uh, actions, uh, promotions, uh, efforts to mitigate carbon dioxide. So now we are at the point where we really need to uh, take uh, strong actions to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this is really a key point, a key challenge for our society. Why do we need to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Uh, by greenhouse gas, we intend any gas in the atmosphere that absorbs and re-emits heat. Carbon dioxide can be considered the main, uh, the most relevant uh, greenhouse gas, considering the impact that human activities have on its concentration in the atmosphere. Uh, in particular, the activity, the human activities are uh, industrial production, residential heating, and the transportation sector. But other greenhouse gases exist, of course, for instance, methane. And each greenhouse gas has its own global warming potential that indicates the amount of warming caused by that gas over a period of time. Uh, by convention, the global warming potential of carbon dioxide is one. And setting this to one enables us to use the carbon dioxide equivalent as a common unit of measurement for global warming potential. I think it is clear looking at that from this uh, table. Here we have the greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide has, as I said, a global warming potential of one. Methane has a much higher global warming potential, 25. So emitting, as you can see here, emitting one kilogram of methane equals to emitting 25 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. By the way, this is the reason why there is concern about the melting of the permafrost at northern latitudes because a lot of uh, methane can be released in the atmosphere from permafrost. Uh, however, um, carbon, carbon dioxide are so important and we are hearing a lot of terms, expressions uh, almost daily that refer to carbon. For instance, embodied carbon, just to give you some relevant definitions, embodied carbon uh, refers to the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the manufacture of a product. Uh, carbon neutral uh, refers uh, to any activity or product for which uh, the carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere is balanced by the removal of an equivalent amount of carbon dioxide by other activities, for instance, by forest management, planting trees. And uh, carbon neutral, of course, is good. Climate positive is even better. Climate positive goes beyond carbon neutral by removing additional carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So in this case, the carbon balance is not neutral, is not zero, but is negative because there is an additional removal of carbon from the atmosphere. 
uh, another definition, a net zero carbon emission basically corresponds to carbon neutral, but it is used within a broader context. It is used to, when referring to human activities at global level. And uh, I believe you already heard about the race to net zero, which uh, is the ensemble of actions commitment to cut greenhouse gas emissions at global level to as close to zero as possible by 2050. This is an ambitious goal indeed, but uh, it is of uh, uh, huge importance and we have to take strong steps in, uh, in this direction. Um, a lot of talking about carbon dioxide, which is a, a simple molecule indeed, uh, an atom of carbon, and two atoms of oxygen. Uh, here I want to highlight, uh, uh, and, and this will be useful later during the presentation, um, here I want to highlight that carbon is just a part of the entire carbon dioxide molecule. Uh, the carbon dioxide molecule has its own molecular mass, and the mass of carbon is just a part of the entire mass of the carbon dioxide molecule. So we'll come back to this later. Uh, it is well known that trees are able to take, uh, through the photosynthesis, to take carbon from carbon dioxide and use this carbon to build their tissues. Uh, here you can see the equation of photosynthesis you can look at that as a simple chemical equation, but it is very fascinating indeed because uh, it is somehow the equation of life. Well, not all life depends on uh, uh, photosynthesis, but uh, uh, a great amount of life depends on photosynthesis. And what happens uh, starting from the left? Well, trees uh, take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They also take water from the soil they use the energy of the sun, the light, the, the sunlight, and they are able this way to synthesize sugar molecules, glucose, and they also release oxygen in the, into the atmosphere. These sugar molecules are uh, processed by trees to build their tissues, basically their wood, lignin, cellulose. So these uh, are the basic molecules from which wood is built. And uh, let's uh, highlight again that uh, carbon is taken from carbon dioxide and is fixed in the molecules of wood. Uh, a, a, a relevant amount is fixed this way. Um, about 50% of wood in weight is carbon. Uh, this is uh, a good approximation. Of course, differences exist between species, but uh, mm, as, a, as a good approximation, 50% of wood in weight is made of carbon and comes from the photosynthesis process. Um, we all know that uh, forests are uh, fundamental carbon stocks at a global level. Uh, this image shows us uh, the stocks uh, uh, considering the different countries and once again reminds us the importance of the Amazonian forest. Um, why is so important the role of forests in terms of carbon stocks? For two reasons. First, uh, the amounts are huge. We are talking of huge amounts of carbon. And second, the uh, length of the storage, the time span is very long. Trees can live for centuries, uh, and this is relevant to the overall storage. So I think now is a, a interesting to take a quick look at the carbon storage in sustainably managed forests versus non-sustainably managed forests. Um, uh, this is a quite recent uh, field of research. Uh, as you can see here, PFC is currently uh, carrying out a project on new knowledge on carbon stocks in managed tropical forests. And 
there is already good evidence that sustainably managed forests store more carbon compared to non-managed forests. There is a, a key reason, uh, Michael uh, mentioned this before, uh, the sustainable man forest management is the, the basic, uh, the starting point to talk about the advantages of wood. We can benefit of all the advantages of wood, a wonderful material in terms of carbon storage, its mechanical properties, nice appearances, and, and so on. So we can take, we can benefit of these advantages only if we start from a sustainable management, that is the first point. Um, about the carbon storage more in detail, um, sustainably managed forests are able to withstand better natural disturbances, for instance, wildfires and natural disturbances are increasing due to climate change. Um, so sustainably managed forests are able to, are less subjected to these disturbances and are able to recover better. And for instance, in case of wildfires, great amounts of carbon dioxide are released into the atmosphere. And so sustainably managed forests are able to limit, uh, at least uh, in part, uh, the losses due to natural disturbances. Another relevant reason, uh, some studies indicate that species richness uh, seems, is, seems correlated to carbon stocks. Uh, and we know that uh, uh, encouraging species richness is uh, a strong point of sustainable forest management. And other studies, recent studies, recent studies um, confirm that uh, forest management can strongly contribute to increasing uh, the overall carbon storage. And well, this is no surprise um, because uh, carbon storage is taken expressly into account by uh, sustainable forest management. Here we can see the requirements of the PFC standard. Uh, carbon storage is mentioned in various parts. For instance, criterion one, uh, the capacity of the forest to store and sequester carbon shall be safeguarded. This is an example. Another one, criterion two, uh, the standard requires that adequate species and structural diversity shall be encouraged. And we have said before that uh, species richness is linked with carbon storage. So overall, it is no surprise that uh, sustainable forest management uh, contribute to increasing carbon storage in forests. Now let's move to from forest to wood because uh, the, the very same carbon that is uh, stored in a living tree remains stored in the tree once the tree is harvested, so remains stored in the logs. And the very same carbon, the very same wood, uh, the very same carbon remains stored in semi-finished products. Well, of course, we have to take into account uh, the losses due to the processing, but the very same carbon is still fixed in wood of a semi-finished product, and it is still fixed, locked in the finished products made of that wood. And the role of wood in terms of carbon storage is nowadays uh, well known and well promoted. Here I have two relevant examples. These are the words of the president of the European Commission uh, that expressly referred to wood when talking about the European Green Deal. You can see here uh, the con construction industry that uses natural materials such as wood or bamboo. So the environmental value of wood is well highlighted here. Here we have another example, a flyer from the Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, we can read here, wooden products lock in carbon throughout their lifetimes, helping to combat climate change. And what do we see here? Well, basically we are seeing furniture. We are seeing uh, parquet flooring, table, chairs, closet. So this highlights the role of wooden products and of wooden furniture. Um, let's 
take a look at how we can calculate the amount of carbon stored in wood and derived products. Uh, now I will show you the calculation methods. The parameters, the elements are listed here. We have to consider the chemical composition of wood and the density of wood. The dimensions, this is very clear. Uh, all the other parameters being equal, well, the bigger the product, the higher the amount of carbon stored. We have to consider also the wood percentage, because if we have solid wood, all the volume is wood, and all the volume considered is storing carbon. But if the product is not made of solid wood, in, for instance, in case of a wood-based panel, well, we have to remove from the wood, from the volume, what is not wood. So for instance, we have to remove the glue. The glue is not wood and is not storing carbon. And of course, then in terms of service life, in terms of carbon storage is relevant to service life, reuse, recycle, we'll talk about that later. So before to look at the method, please uh, remember that carbon storage is part of the overall carbon footprint. So we are focusing now on carbon storage, but the overall carbon footprint has to be assessed. Um, so when we manufacture product, we have to consider the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that product. But for wood-based products, typically the uh, greenhouse gas emissions are considerably lower compared to alternative uh, products and alternative materials. Um, now it can be a good moment for a first poll question, a quick break of uh, just a few seconds. If uh, you can help me in showing, yes. So please take uh, 30 seconds to answer to this first question and then we will move on. Okay, well, the correct question, the correct answer was the first one. Um, carbon storage in wooden furniture can greatly contribute considering the amount, both the amount and the time span of the storage. Uh, as I said before, for forests, the amount and time span are relevant. And in case of wooden furniture, well, we have great relevant amounts of wood used at global level, also for relevant time spans, because furniture can last for uh, 50 years, maybe a party flooring can last for 100 years. So the time span of wooden furniture is relevant. Let's move on uh, to the uh, calculation method. Here we are. Please don't be scared of, uh, from this uh, uh, equation. It is a simple multiplication indeed. And I think it is easier to look at that starting from the right part. So we want to calculate the among amount of carbon dioxide uh, associated, sequestered by products. And uh, so starting from the right, uh, here we have the density of wood uh, in kilograms per uh, cubic meter. And here we have the volume of wood. So, for instance, let's consider a wood with a density of 500 kilograms per cubic meter, and let's take one cubic meter of that wood. So, 500 per one. Well, clearly, we are we have we are considering 500 kilograms of wood. But wood always contains water, the moisture content of wood. Well, unless we have oven dry wood in in uh, laboratory conditions, but otherwise wood always contains water. And water does not store carbon. 
water is just water. So we have to remove the weight of water from the overall weight of food. We can consider the normal moisture content of wood, which is 12%. So in this example, we can, mm, we can divide 500 kilograms of wood divided per 1.12. So we are removing water. And 500 divided per 1.12, well, 12, well, is 446 kilograms of uh, dry, oven dry wood. We have removed it water. So this is, uh, this is the, um, the, the wood we are considering. As I said before, not all wood is uh, uh, made of carbon. 50% of wood is made of carbon. And so this is why we have to multiplicate 446 kilograms of oven dry wood per 0 0.5. We are considering only the carbon in that wood. And this makes 223 kilograms of carbon. But as I said before, carbon is just a part of the overall carbon dioxide molecule. So if we want to find the corresponding amount of carbon dioxide sequestered, we have to multiply the amount of carbon per this coefficient, per 3.767. So this enables us to find the weight in kilograms of carbon dioxide that is associated to the product. And if we do the math, the result in this case is 818 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So it is a relevant amount. Uh, as I said, the calculation is quite simple. Here you can see two other examples referring to spruce solid wood or referring to birch solid wood. Um, please note, now we have considered solid wood, so all the volume of wood is wood, so all the volume is storing carbon. Uh, for wood-based products, for instance, wood-based pa panels, please remember that you have to calculate the fraction of wood in the product. So you have to remove the fraction that is not wood, that is, for instance, glue. Or if you are considering uh, a wooden couch, well, of course, you have to uh, remove the tissue, the cushions of the couch, because that parts are not wood. This calculation can be applied at various levels. You can calculate the storage of a single product, of several products. Uh, you can calculate uh, the amount of carbon stored by the wood industry of a country. So there are several different uh, applications. Here, I want to show you the outcome of a study that I have realized together with uh, Richard Bergen, a colleague of mine from the US. We have uh, calculated the carbon stored by furnishing wood-based products in an Italian apartment taken as a case study. Um, here you can see the apartment. Of course, the furnishing in an apartment varies depending on several factors. Uh, for instance, the economic means of the owners or the style, the choices of the owners or the, ge the geographical region. Uh, so several variables are present. Uh, I'd say that uh, these can be considered as, as a reasonable uh, example of uh, an apartment, of the furnishing of an apartment in Northern Italy. Here, what, what, what we have done, uh, well, we have firstly identified all the furnishings uh, that are made of wood-based products. Here are uh, colored in light blue, for instance, uh, couch, uh, tables, the chairs, the kitchen, the beds, uh, parquet flooring. And uh, so first we have identified the products, the wood-based products. And then we have applied the calculation method that I have already described. We have applied that method to the entire apartment. By the way, the method that I have shown is widely accepted and standardized at international level. So here is an example of the 
calculation. This refers to the living room. For instance, let's see the flooring. We have uh, uh, measured the dimensions and also considering the thickness of the parquet flooring, uh, the wooden species, European oak and birch, the product type, basically a composite parquet flooring is an overlay plywood, and applying the calculation method, well, the result for this uh, part of the living room is of 200, around 200 kilograms of carbon dioxide sequestered from the atmosphere. And so on for all the other furnishings. Let's look at another one, the bookcase. Uh, here are the dimensions. Uh, the species is European walnut. Here, the bookcase is made of solid wood and the overall uh, storage is of around 120 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So summing up the carbon dioxide associated to all the furnishings, well, the result for the entire apartment is of around 3,000 and a half kilograms of carbon dioxide uh, associated, sequestered from the atmosphere in the entire apartment, which is of 77 square meter. This is an interesting result, and you can do the math yourself. You can consider the, all the apartments of the building, or you can consider it an entire city made uh, with uh, 100,000 inhabitants or a million, two millions or inhabitants. So you can understand that the uh, amounts of carbon dioxide are uh, that can be sequestered from the atmosphere are very remarkable. As for the contribution of the different furnishings in this case study, well, uh, first place goes to the closets uh, with more than 1,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide sequestered. Then second place for parquet flooring and baseboards. Third place for kitchen furniture and then low, uh, minor amounts for the other uh, furnishings. So this can be another interesting uh, um, indication of it. Um, maybe here we can have another poll question, second one. So another quick break to answer at this poll question. Then we will move on. Okay, now we can see the correct answer. That is 0 0.5 kilograms. I hope this is clear. I have repeated that several times during the presentation. Half, around half of wood, of oven dry wood, is carbon. Uh, is carbon. Okay, let's move on. Close. And here we are. Uh, yes, a final, uh, uh, a final remark about this study. Uh, if we consider the carbon dioxide uh, sequestered uh, in terms of kilograms per square meter of the apartment, well, the result is 40, around 46 uh, kilograms per square meter. To enlarge a bit the overview of the study, we have also considered a so-called low scenario. So it is the case study from which we have simulated the removal of the parquet flooring. And in this case, the uh, storage uh, falls to around 35 uh, kilograms per square meter. We have also considered a so-called high scenario. So we have in this case simulated the addition of the parquet flooring in the bathroom and in the kitchen as well. 
and also the addition of wooden windows. And in this case, the uh, amount of uh, carbon dioxide increases uh, to around 55 uh, uh, kilograms per square meter. Um, here is a good point to underline that the storage does not end when the apartment is renewed and the furnishings are disassembled, but the storage can go on if wood is recycled. And so I want to uh, talk a little bit about the cascading use of wood, which is key in terms of sustainability and carbon storage. The, the principle of cascading use of wood is uh, uh, to extend as, as much as possible the carbon storage uh, in wood and to uh, extend also the total biomass availability within the considered system. And according to this principle, wood has been used uh, in a specific order of priorities. So first, wood-based products, and second, extending as much as possible their service life. Then, once the service life is ended, reusing, if possible, recycling, if possible, and then only at the end, using wood for bioenergy or going to the final disposal. Here you can see two examples of cascades. Uh, here we have a parquet flooring, let's say that uh, stays in service for 50 years, and after these 50 years, it goes directly to the end of life disposal. Here we have a longer cascade, the very same parquet flooring used for 50 years, then it is disassembled and it is uh, uh, processed to obtain particles that are used for producing particle balls. So recycled particle balls made of recycled wood. And these particle balls are then used to make kitchen furniture. And that kitchen furniture stays uh, in service for, uh, let's say, uh, 30 years. So we are extending the carbon storage of the very same wood, again, taking into account the losses due to the processing. But the very same wood, the very same carbon, uh, is, is the very same wood is storing the very same carbon over a longer period of time. Then you can uh, think about other steps of this cascade until the end of life disposal. And as I said, cascading use of wood is key for several reasons. So it is in line with several sustainable development goals. And in the furniture sector, this is a multidimensional issue with uh, several aspects involved. Starting from the first decision, whether or not to use wood or to use recycled wood to make the furniture then how much wood, which wood-based products, and so on. And so the cascading use of wood involves uh, wood and furnishings from the first design. Then it uh, is relevant also to consider the service life, and typically a proper design enables to extend the service life. And then when the service life is ended, well, there are several possibilities for reusing or recycling the the furniture. The example of particle board is uh, that I have made before is relevant because uh, nowadays a lot of particle board is produced using uh, recycled wood. A third and final poll, poll question, then I'm coming to the end, so you can try to answer to that question. Okay. And hope it's clear that the key principle of cascading use of wood is uh, uh, sustaining over time, extending over time uh, the carbon storage. So I want to close, here we are. I want to end this presentation with two quick uh, 
examples from the real from marketplace industrial sector. This is maybe you already know this uh, marketplace, this system, Pure Heart. Here you have the link to the website. It is a marketplace related to, to carbon removals. How do these work? Well, suppliers develop carbon negative products or services, and Pure Heart verifies these carbon removals and issues relative certificates. And the companies can purchase and retire such certificates to fulfill their purposes. So the voluntary market of carbon removals is nowadays real. It is increasing. And, and so let's hope that it will increase more and more in the next years. Another example here from Conlegno, an Italian association of the good sector. I'm from Italy. This is the Legno Clima project. Can be translated as uh, climate good. Uh, so this association is uh, developing a system a platform to support the companies of the uh, Italian good sector uh, to support them in uh, uh, calculating the carbon stored by their products and uh, to valorize their products. This system is currently under development. I believe it will be ready in a few months so let's see how it will work, uh, but uh, it is uh, important here to note that uh, association can uh, considerably sustain and participate in supporting uh, companies to highlight uh, the carbon storage and the value, the environmental value of their products. So I think I am quite uh, on schedule. Um, final remarks, it's hard to, to, to choose to find a conclusion for such a huge topic. Here are my picks. Uh, first, I want to uh, recall that carbon storage is part of the carbon footprint. And as I said before, um, typically greenhouse gas emissions associated to wood based products are quite low compared to other products. Then, wooden furniture can considerably contribute in the race to zero, again, for two reasons. First, the remarkable amounts of products and of carbon stored at global level, and also the time span of the storage. Then, as Michael has uh, pointed out in his introduction, we cannot ask magic to wood and to wood-based products. So they can contribute, and this shall be a part of the old overall strategy. People uh, are, are important. We, we had to find several solutions that all together contributes to reducing the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And to companies, well, to companies, carbon storage in wood and furniture is relevant both for ethical reasons per se, let's not forget the ethical reasons, and also for marketing reasons. Uh, consumer, consumers are nowadays more and more attentive to greener products. Maybe uh, new opportunities can arise, for instance, from the green public procurement, procurement and also highlighting the carbon storage in uh, wood-based furniture can help in providing a greener image of the company. And again, customers are more and more attentive to greener companies. So there are important marketing reasons. So uh, let's hope that in the future, uh, producers and consumers, when, when they look at furniture, at a couch, at a closet, a closet, they not only see a product, but they also are aware, they understand, they perceive the high environmental value of that furnishing, the high, the high value in terms of carbon storage. So that's it. Thank you for uh, listening. These are my contacts. And uh, well, I think uh, now we can start the discussion section. Uh, however, the, the world is back to Torsen. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Francesco. Uh, quite an interesting presentation, and we've got quite a few questions for you. Um, I recommend that you stop sharing your screen so that we can all be visible and live. Let me start in 
right sequence of when the questions arrive. We've got a question from Rizki from Indonesia. She is working for a wood and rattan manufacturer. Do you have any idea about the potential of non-timber forest products such as rattan to help tackle climate change? Uh, well, first of all, if you want to answer the question as well, please, uh, you are welcome. We are here all together to discuss. Um, about rattan, well, rattan stores carbon as well from the atmosphere. So the, um, the, the, the topic, the calculation is quite similar. Uh, we have to consider how much carbon is present in rattan. I, I do not know that, we, maybe that can be found. So I, I said before that around half percent of wood is carbon. So we have to find how, how much fraction of rattan in weight is carbon. Then the, the, the situation is quite similar. Super, thank you so much. We've got a question from Arun. Um, he's asking, while calculating carbon stored in wooden furniture, how is the carbon emission in the course of processing from cutting a tree to right, the final consumer, transportation, etc., accounted for? That question is quite similar uh, to a question that we received on LinkedIn. Uh, from Clara, who is asking, why isn't the life cycle assessment made more obvious for wooden furniture to show consumers their positive impact? This is a good uh, point. Uh, why? I have to say that uh, this uh, field is very wide and very complex. Uh, so, uh, for sure, we can try to improve how the results of life cycle assessment are uh, communicated. We can try to simplify them. Uh, there are, for instance, uh, systems uh, uh, that uh, provides the, with, with a short code the uh, environmental value of a product in, in categories, for instance, A, B, C, D, as we, as we see for some uh, electric uh, device devices. So, there are uh, attempts to simplify uh, the, uh, the uh, showing of life cycle assessments results. But this field actually is very complex because it takes into account uh, a lot of things, starting from uh, the, uh, the supply of the raw resources, the processing, transportation, and so on. Uh, APDs, uh, environmental product declarations, are also a way, uh, an effective attempt to um, show the results of life cycle assessments in a clear and comparable way. But, uh, well, of course, you have to, to have some knowledge about that. And, uh, and of course, as I said before, to, to, to answer to the first uh, part of the question, well, now we have focused on carbon storage, but uh, transportation, uh, emissions during processing are key because we have to consider the overall uh, greenhouse gases emissions associated to a product. Uh, I have already said that uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, are typically low for wood-based products compared to other products. Uh, let's also consider, since we have mentioned transportation, that a uh, a relevant, remarkable potential of wood is the use of local wood. Uh, because uh, transportation emission, emissions associated to transportation can be very high in some cases. And so using local wood uh, sourced at uh, local level, uh, regional level, for instance, well, this can be a very effective way to drop even more the overall greenhouse gas emissions associated to wood based products. Thank you so much. Michael, do you have anything to add? 
Yeah, just an amendment from a PFC perspective, you know, the calculating the emissions in the chain of custody in a supply chain, of course, is something super interesting. Uh, uh, and and so to, to know something at the end of the day uh, about the product and the whole supply chain. And PFC started the development of a, we, we called it the working title is quite difficult. We It's called the emission data transfer standard. Uh, already a few years ago. <clears throat> that means a standard uh, um, containing rules and requirement and processes, how to transfer uh, emission data from one supply chain step to the next supply chain step. So that the final user in, in the end of the, the final producer in the end of a supply chain can communicate those emissions to whomever necessary, whether publicly or to regulators or in which area ever. The, the challenge was and still is that organizations lost a little bit interest in such things and the standard is still lying in a cupboard and waiting for a further development and, and use. But of course, a key question, what to do with the emissions in a supply chain. Which tells me if you, the audience, are interested in such a standard, right? make sure that it comes out of the cupboard. Francesco, we have a question regarding those figures that you used in your case study. Would that be the same values in the case of using tropical wood? That's what Pierre is asking. And Laura is asking a very similar question because she's asking, is there any database about the wood species specific carbon content available? Yes. So, um, I said that 50% is a good and broadly accepted approximation, but of course, uh, variety exists uh, among different species. And I recall now an article published on Nature. I cannot recall the title and the authors, but uh, if, you, if you go on Nature or maybe Nature Climate Change, so these scientific journals, uh, there was an interesting article about the differences uh, in uh, carbon fraction in wood and the differences uh, depends uh, on uh, the fact that we are considered hard wood or soft wood and also the provenance, for instance, tropical forests or uh, temperate forests. So my suggestion is to browse a little bit on uh, such journals uh, and you can find reference data. So if you want to have uh, more accurate calculations, as I, if I remember well, uh, well, 50% uh, is an average approximation and the range can be plus minus 4%. So let's say from 46 to 54. This is uh, the, the range, I, I, I believe. However, we have to consider that we are taking estimates and, and we have to, to choose which is the level of accuracy that we want. So uh, if we are considering a single object, maybe we want and we are able to be uh, highly accurate. But if we are considering, uh, for instance, the production of an entire uh, sector of a country, the furniture sector of Italy, for instance, the annual production. Well, of course, we have to, we, we, we cannot be so much accurate and we have to approximate. And so in that case, using 50% can be, can be a good approximation. Uh, as for tropical wood, uh, well, basically it depends as we have seen in the calculation method, uh, uh, it depends on the density of wood. Uh, a lot of tropical woods have a relevant density. So I have shown before the calculation with a wood of 500 kilograms per cubic meter, which could be a uh, soft wood. Uh, if you want to consider a specific tropical wood, well, choose your wood, find the density, maybe 800 kilograms per cubic meter. And so you are properly taking into account the fact that you add that tropical wood in your in your product. Thank you so much. Another technical question from Maya. 
we are talking about the carbon storage potential of furniture. And she's asking, is there a minimum time frame that is required for, for, for furniture or for wood products uh, to store carbon so that they qualify? Which gets me to, to another point that I'm interested in. Since the wood is burned anyway at some point in time and released with the carbon released in, in the atmosphere, does it actually matter? that we store carbon for a limited time? Well, thank you for this and also for the other questions. Uh, um, the participants are uh, picking uh, uh, relevant uh, points uh, and also typical points uh, that are uh, commonly asked. Um, about the time span, um, furniture can last in service. So let's not think now about the recycling phase. We hope that wood is recycled more and more and more, but now let's look at the service life of the object of the furnishing uh, uh, just manufactured. And uh, the service life can be of uh, 30, 50 years. This can be a reasonable uh, length, uh, time span, but it can last even more. For instance, a parquet flooring can last a century, maybe two centuries in service. And in some cases, a parquet flooring just need a little bit of uh, uh, sanding uh, and it uh, comes uh, as new again. So basically the very same parquet flooring can stay in service a lot of time. I can say that typically studies on LCA uh, calculation in terms of carbon storage, environmental equations, uh, consider a time span of 100 years. And so with the wooden furniture and uh, construction wood, uh, we have products that are more or less matching this relevant period of time. Um, that's the first question. Uh, the second one uh, was about, I don't recall, uh, um, was, was about... Uh, Does it matter that the carbon is stored um, for, the, for temporary time? Ah, yes, okay, okay. Um, yes, usually when I talk to my students, I say that uh, firewood is storing carbon as well. Uh, the point is that firewood is commonly dried for uh, three years, maybe five years, and then burned. So the storage of firewood is very, is very uh, limited. But the point is, here, here is, uh, is the question, uh, the, the core of the question, the fact that at the end, uh, carbon dioxide is re-emitted into the atmosphere. And this is correct. So what is the point? The point is that t uh, trees take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, store it in wood, and then when we release the very same carbon dioxide, so the overall balance is zero. Uh, where we, which is the advantage? That we are avoiding the emission of fossil, of carbon dioxide that has a fossil origin. Because when we use wood, we are within a, a period of time of uh, a century, maybe uh, two centuries, uh, who knows? When we are using fossil fuels, uh, well, we are taking carbon that is stored from geological eras. And we are, so this is a net gain into the atmosphere over the short period. And we are interested in the quite short period of a century. Uh, so this is a key point. The balance of using wood from storing to emitting is zero. This is the advantage of biogenic carbon compared to carbon that comes from fossil fuels. Uh, another advantage of wood is that usually in, in the production phases, some wood, the wastes of the process, are burned to feed the production process. And so wood itself contributes in not using uh, fossil fuels during the very production process. 
Thank you so much. We are almost up on time, so we can't go through all the questions, but with the last questions, I would like to move back from wood as a material back to the forests. And Paulina is asking, do non-sulfide forests store CO2 the same way as sulfide forests? Okay, relevant question as well. Uh, well, every forest stores carbon, trees stores carbon, and so forests are storing carbon whether they are certified or not. The, quick, the key question is, are sustainably certified forests storing more carbon than non-managed forests? And as I've said before, there is evidence already for that. This is a quite recent field of study because this issue is quite recent. So maybe 50 years ago, there was not so much interest in comparing this aspect of forests. But uh, nowadays, with the uh, gigantic importance that carbon storage has for our society, it is uh, very interesting to understand how much sustainably managed forests, uh, how much more carbon they store compared to non-managed forests. And uh, uh, so there is evidence for that. And I would like to recall the main elements. First element, uh, uh, sustainably managed forests are less subjected to natural disturbances. Species richness uh, is linked with carbon storage. And also um, the, the management enables to obtain and maximize the structure of the forest. And this also optimizes the carbon storage. So there is evidence for that. I would say stay tuned because this is an interesting topic and I believe we will have more and more data about that uh, over, over the next years. I myself, well, I mostly deal with wood and forests are linked but are not exactly my, my field, but I really would like to find projects and activities uh, to understand uh, this better and more and more these, these relations. Thank you so much. And you gave me a keyword for my closing, right? The link. And if you go back to Mr. Link, I think one of the things that you have outlined is that PFC is part of this missing link. As a provider of raw material from sustainably managed forests. So keep Mr. Link in mind. And if you want to put your brain into a bit of leisure mode. I've seen that movie yesterday. It is actually a really nice one. So I highly recommend it. And I thank you for the interest in this webinar. And I hope to see you all soon.